What's up, everyone, and welcome to the Tune Up Podcast, where we talk about the automotive industry and car care, specifically that 99% of your car's life that is spent outside of the dealership. In this episode, we discuss the importance of community in growing your auto shop, or if you're a car owner, in finding the auto shop that works best for you. There are so many important points in this one, and at the center of it, it's all about building relationships and trust. So how do you do that? I'm Justin Simpson, and I'm joined by Zach Bumpham. The two of us, alongside the rest of the awesome people in this room, make up your tune-up team. And all of us have amazing various perspectives, passions, and insights about the car care industry. So let's get started. What's up, Zach? What's up, Justin? How you doing, man? I'm doing so good. I'm really excited about this topic. And you know what I'm extra excited about is hearing from the rest of our crew. Oh, yeah. With that, let me introduce these ragtag batch of rapscallions. Yes. First position we got. (laughs) Let's do it. Is Mike 05 STI Bordeaux. How's it going, everyone? I, uh, I, I love the choice in cars this week. Finally fit in one. That's great. Uh, I'm a bug eye guy, but blob eyes are cool too. Uh, I'm going to guess rally inspired this week. Yeah. You don't, I don't well, think let's you get to Bold move, bold move, make it a guess <laughs> without guessing <laughs> any other names. Let's get some more data points here before you draw into your conclusions here. How about uh, Lucas driving on rubble, Conyer? What's going on, everyone? I was really hoping for like a GR Corolla or something to match the theme here, but I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> I see we have uh, Jazda Pogruza uh, in, in Polish for driving our, or drifting sideways at high speed. So, uh, yeah. Happy to be All here. Right. Wait, there's a there's term. There's point. a specific term for dri- for <laughs> drifting at high speeds. That's awesome. <laughs> this this is should be the most proud that you have ever been of being Polish. Like in this moment, right? <laughs> I've had some, I've had some moments. This one, yeah, this one's up there. <laughs> oh, that's so good. All right, next we got Gallagher F one fifty Wilson. I drive Ford pickup because my daddy told me they're built tough. Hey, hey, how's it going today, guys? Okay. I don't know where that came from. I mean, I'm good with it, but. All right. All right. Keep thinking. And then we have Jonathan Audi S1 Moretti. Ooh, fancy, fancy. Um, what's up? Good to see you guys. Uh, I like uh, when I like tune up team as part of the intro. And I think we should do some sort of like uh, dodgeball inspired, like tune up team, tune up team when we walk in. Cause I really want to <laughs> see us do that at one point. We can do we that. Do practice run in. How do you do it? You start with the T and then you go up and back down. Yeah. T-U-T. Tune T-U-T. up. T. Yeah. I like it. When we do a live episode, you know, in person, we can just yeah. get you on the intro for that, Moretti, just doing yeah. the dance. Yeah. 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 We'll have it choreographed. It'll be good. But what do you guys think? What's the commonality? What's the theme there? I'm going to be honest. I, I had a little trouble with this one. I mean, there's definitely an off-road, uh, you know, loose surface, all-wheel drive, potentially four-wheel drive. Uh, F-150 uh, throws me off, though. Yeah, a little that's bit. a real a bit. real flag on the play, yeah. I'm going to say. This, yeah. this feels like which one of these is not like the other. One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> <laughs> Mike was pretty dang close. It's a, I think he referenced having a Ken Block poster behind him. Oh. Does that help? Uh, super cool. Okay. It is Jim Connor uh, Cars. Jim Connor awesome. Cars. Yeah. That's awesome. F 150, though? Seen- oh, is that one of Kim Block's cars? Didn't he do like the truck and like that twin turbo build? That thing was cool. Yeah, I think that's a cool. stretch calling that a, an F 150, but I still think uh, <laughs> <It's> like, officially <laughs> like NASCARs are Camrys, right? Like, <laughs> sure. <laughs> fair, that's fair, fair. But yeah, shout out to Ken Block for sure. May he rest in peace and also maintain an epic legend of the rally industry and online media and all the things above for sure. Heck yeah. Yeah, dude. You guys have any uh, other favorite Ken Block? cars unicorn's my favorite that's the wildest car to ever exist i like i said i want that on my wall it's it's like just the who who fabricated that car just nailed it <laughs> they did everything yeah. perfect it's just wild yeah i'd back that i think the unicorn's my favorite too 
I think we left that off because we didn't want to throw, we didn't want you guys to get it too easily. You know, it's like you throw in the Mustang and I feel like <laughs> it becomes much more obvious. Yeah. Sure. Sure. It's pretty good. Although yeah. that Cosworth, he had like a, like a Cosworth Escort, if I remember right. Oh yeah. yeah that's, a, that's a close yeah. second just because yeah. of how niche and cool that car is. So wasn't there a wagon as well? Like a Subaru wagon? That's yep. like his OG yep. days, right? He was like yeah. Team Subaru from like well, no, the one. Well, no, the new one too. They did the Legacy uh, that's, GT that's wagon with, with Travis Pastrana. And that, yes. that one thing was oh, epic. Oh, yes. That one was well. nice. I don't think I've seen and that. Then, Someone share me a link after this. That one's good. It's got like a custom built ga gauge cluster. It's all yes. retro looking. And then they have like yes. the little <laughs> flaps that just move up and down. I'll send you a link, ready. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and for those who like now. have not ever seen Jim Khanna and are now listening to this and like, what is this? We will drop a link in the description as well because right. you must check that out. <laughs> I'm gonna give an honorable mention to the, uh, what was it, the Huna Pegasus? No, was that? Mm, am I saying that right? Oh, Pegasus. 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 Yeah. 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 We saw yeah. that one at SEMA uh, last year, and it was just epic to see in person to see like the the scale of this car and exactly what's been done to it. It was just uh, kind of breathtaking in person. Yeah, that's a Pikes Peak record car, right? The the Porsche. Nice. I think that kind of segues perfectly into what we're trying to cover in our main topic today. And, and our topic is building your community as a shop owner and finding a shop that you can trust as a car owner, right? Those things go to hand in hand. And I, I'll be fully transparent right now. I don't have a local shop that I fully go to and love and trust right now. And so, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think about this for me and, and my real life, but what do you guys see as things that shops are doing well and not well? And how can the auto repair shops build long lasting relationships with their customers to increase that loyalty, trust, repeat business to make me feel like I want to take my car there all the time? Like, what do, what do you guys think? I mean, I'm going to jump in here one, one second real quick on this one. As we were talking, even through the hot take around uh, you know, social versus word of mouth. And, um, I think when you think about community building, you definitely think word of mouth, you definitely think building long lasting relationships. And, and I wonder, you know, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately within this topic is, is referrals and like, you know, how that word of mouth isn't a ten, in, intentionally a referral to a business. So it's like, how, how can shops, you know, incentivize and reward their loyal customers that they already have to then bring more people in their into their fold. And, and I, I, I think that's an under leveraged um, opportunity to, to build a lasting and, and lifelong customer where, you know, you kick your, your customer, a, a huge discount on their next, um, their next work order or, or something like that, that can, can really just add value to them and also like really make them appreciate what you're doing and, and pass that on to the next person and kind of keep that going. So that was, that was one thing that came up for me is, uh, that I think is, is under leveraged. And I know that margins are tight in shops and they've got, they've got a lot going on. Um, but looking further out and saying, okay, if I can keep this person in my fold for two, three, five years, that sure. is going to pay tenfold um, from just giving them a discount on on one, um, you know, one invoice. I, I would actually uh, recommend getting a little weird and flipping it and offering a discount to someone that's brought in by an existing customer, um, because you know they're the new person that needs to experience your culture and your shop and build that trust. Um, and I think the there, there is a margin conversation where it's not, I can't afford to discount all my best customers because they're my best customers. That's probably one of my primary revenue streams, right? The people that are always coming back, but um, th giving them the social cred of they've put their name on the line to bring customers to you. So take care of that person they sent to you. And the value for them is the, is the social credibility you give back of, oh, you know, Gallagher sent you to me. Okay, great. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to knock 10% off of this bill. Your first time visiting. We really appreciate you giving us a shot, something like that. 
I think could could go a lot more into building the long term uh, 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 connection with that new customer, but also makes that guy that sent his friend like now he's you know uh, he or she really has the social credibility built into that like oh you sent me to your guy and he really took care of me that's great right so um, I, I just just a little recommendation of something that I used to think about when I was doing that. No, I think that's a solid point. We used to do that. So I would, I would actually give, I would, I would double dip. So if somebody referred a customer, I would give them a discount and I would give the new customer a discount as well. Um, I think if you compare even a slightly, you know, discount for referring and referred new customers um, to other forms of customer acquisition. So if we're talking paid AdWords, um, time invested in social media, uh, I think, you know, dollars and cents, like you were saying earlier, Marty, referrals are probably going to win, even even if you're giving a pretty decent discount um, over the life of the customer, that that's going to pay back. You know, you've got to do some run some numbers on your business and what's your average customer's life cycle? How much are they going to spend in that life cycle? Sure. You know, and walk it back from there uh, and start to so say, there's a okay, scale piece it? to it, right? Because it at at a scale, yeah. if, I, if I'm running a hundred shops, okay, my media, my, my ad spend is probably going to have a higher return than my one to one all the time. Sure. But if I own two, my one to ones are going to be a lot more. Yeah. yeah. If, if we're talking, say an average single location, you know, a small business, you know, that's run, you know, three to five employees or whatever, it's going to be, it's going to have a very high, um, you know, payoff, I think in terms of the investment, Typically, I think that I think to scale back just a second, though, the first thing I always come to mind and we're kind of dancing around this with social media is like f- what draws people to a business, right? Sometimes it's just the, your proximity, lowest cost, whatever. But I think your, your highest value customers come stay and refer because they do business with people they like um, it's sort of axiomatic. Right. And so um, I think what social media does great, and and y'all said this earlier, but I just like to I, like it's gelling in my head this way is like it gives customers a window into your personality as a shop, as a business, as an owner, right, or whoever's managing it, right, and that's really I think taking a brand beyond the idea of you know we're a logo and a company. No, we're we're people. You know what are our hobbies? Like in the last shop I worked at, my other service advisor was big into fly fishing, and he would talk about it, right? We you know. The, the, the newsletter would go out to our customers and talk about Charlie's fly fishing trip, right? And here's here's where Charlie was fly fishing, right? And it was this, or here's where the owner went on vacation. Here's some cool stuff we saw. And it created this huge amount of personal relationship. People would come in and they love to talk to Charlie. They love to talk to the owner, Mike, because like they felt like they were part of our lives, right? Um, and it, it created you know, some of the best loyalty. And, and the referral program worked really well, I think, in, in tandem with that because it was a crew of likable people, right? You know, everybody was excited to come in um, and we had great customers and we had great success with that because of that social media, I think is a layer that you can add to that. But I think there's a lot of ways you can build that without initially investing in a YouTube channel or, you know, complex social media architecture and, and uh, investment there as well. Yeah. I think it's important how some of these topics like dovetail. So I would recommend you check out uh, one of the previous episodes of tune up where we talk about staff retention and things like that, where if your team is happy and they are proud to be a part of your business, that's going to bleed into those customer interactions, which is then going to bleed into your referrals. So, uh, you know, so many steps away, you might not be thinking about that with your staffing choices, but it all plays a part and connects into how the uh, you know how people view your business, the happiness of your employees, and they want to and who they want to come and, and sit around for half an hour while something's happening in their car. Yeah, I think that, I think that's a solid. I think there's um, you know circling back to that that episode as well. I think we talked about some about like how you could make the you know how do you build that internally for your team culture. But I think the same thing applies looking how do you build that in your customer base, right? I've talked to I remember seeing. Uh, article probably in Ratchet or Wrench or something about a shop that had, I think the owner's wife was a hairstylist. And so they actually found a building that worked for them to have the shop and the hair salon businesses together. So, you know, people could drop off their vehicle, get their hair cut or, you know, styled or whatever they're doing at the salon while they wait. And it created just this unique spot where these two businesses had a, you know, compounding effect for each other. Um, so you could do the same thing with a coffee shop, right? I think I, I threw out the idea of like having a, you know, a small gym or a weight room in there. Like there's some fun things you could do that would be, you know, tied to the owner's personality and things like that. They're going to create a unique thing. They're going to totally set you apart, right? You're, you're the shop 
with a hair salon attached. Like that's going to be, that's just going to create buzz around town just because it's, it's odd. Most people haven't seen it before. What's our running tally on how many times uh, Gallagher drops, how much he works out? Into the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we've gotten through one. No, just... oh, so good. That's a good point though. I like the idea of like a daycare or something like, or at least like a kid's area, you know, like once that catches on, everyone's going to, going to know like, okay, this shop has somewhere for my kid to hang out while I spend my time there. Um, I I'll say that, um, I think, the hard part about earning a customer's trust is partially due to like the stigma that a shop carries in general. Uh, and I think that's because it's really hard sometimes to convey, uh, the value of a repair. Um, you know, you have like a cracked phone screen. It's kind of obvious what replacing that screen is going to do for you. You know, you're going to be able to see your phone easily again, um, for a car repair, like a check engine light, um, they might not even have symptoms, you know, they just know that it's this flashing light in their dashboard. And at some point they should probably look at it. Um, so when they come into the shop, I think it's super important for the shop to set expectations very early on and just guide the customer through the process as best as you can start with the basics, you know, Hey, this is why you came in. This is our game plan for fixing your issue. Here's about how much it's going to cost, like laying that out. Uh, and, and doing that every single time for every single customer is incredibly important. And then uh, the consistency and follow up from there, just having some sort of process in place that you can just task your team with knowing that every customer gets the same experience. You know, I followed up, you know, this, the first day, the first week, you know, however the shop decides, you know, whatever program or process the shop decides is best. Um, but so process being like a, like a, like a standard procedure for the team to follow when, when. Yeah. I mean, you know, we work in software, so having a software helps there. There's some automations of, you know, sending customers messages and putting calendar events on the board and uh, just having a visu visual in front of you to remind you to accomplish those tasks with each customer. Um, I think it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do. Service writer has a very busy day. Um, but it goes uh, really far with a customer, uh, especially if you set expectations early on and things go wrong, which they will most of the time, right? The customer knows that, you know, you're following up with them. You're doing your best to inform them of, you know, what went wrong and, and what you're going to do to fix it. And even if you, sometimes you, you fail to successfully fix the car to the, the customer's expectation, at least they have... In some cases, if not most cases, they have the feeling of earning your trust. Are you earning their trust because you guys had that consistent communication? I sometimes get so frustrated that I still don't run a shop when I'm having these conversations because you just gave me a great idea of like the visualization of like, here's a map of what happens when you come in the business. Like we pull the car around, we check it out. We, this is what we do. This is how we order parts. Like a, literally a visual on the wall that a customer could look at and be like, what happens when my car goes away? Uh, What's I, happening I love behind that the idea. scenes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think that. every, every other like kind of thing in a customer's life is more like fast food right? It's, I'm going to go, I'm going to order, I'm going to get what I want. If it's wrong, I'm going to yell at somebody, then it's going to get fixed and then I'm going to get out of here, right? Okay. It's so all we all just know like, how Zach operates at the restaurant. <laughs> all right. <we> <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, and I think it's like- I ordered two they, filet of fish. <laughs> yes, I only have three pickles. I needed four. Um, you know, and I think that that flow is such a cool idea to be able to set appropriate expectations in a real way because if people coming in with, with fast food type expectations they're going to find a pretty easy way to get pissed off and that's yeah. and that's going to break the relationship from the beginning it's a yeah great this, this goes like into that that like transparency and and just like being up front i think Beretti, you're talking about that map and it sounds like kind of cheesy at, at first but it, it, there's so much unknown for the customer around like what happens yeah and and it's so hard to to be involved in that process in a lot of shop environments so it's like how do yeah. you you know, keep that customer involved in a way that they have that visibility. Um, and as you kind of said, as a follow up, if there is something that is a challenge or, or something that they're working on, they, they keep you in the loop, you know? Yeah. One of my favorite things that we did, and I know it's like, it's 
truly difficult because uh, uh, insurance reasons, right? And safety is we had an open door kind of policy with our shop. So we could, we'd bring customers back. Actually, er, early days, we just let people come and hang out on the shop floor. Eventually, we had to stop that because we had some real, uh, you know, uh, darting under car folks and grabbing stuff folks that eventually we had to stop letting people be unattended <laughs> on the shop floor. But, uh, I think it, you know, really removed a lot of the mystery. It's like, you can see we had a glass wall between our waiting room and our, and where the shop was. So you could see what was happening to your car. I think that's important. Even though I know, I don't think there's a technician in the world who I wants can't to stand have someone it. just, there's nothing yeah. I hated more than but the customer standing right behind me and asking me zoo, bro. every step <laughs> of the process, why I'm doing something. What it's, about when they make recommendations? Like, is that better? <laughs> when I, if I, if I say, well, you're, you know, I would, I would do. Are you torquing that valve stem cap? <laughs> 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 I, I was just going to make a quick comment, which ties back to our previous episode as well. We were talking about uh, what can you do to make your shop a little more of a pleasant experience for, experience for customers. And one of the final notes we, we ended on in that episode was taking baby steps in that way or in that direction of making these improvements. Uh, and a more recent experience for myself was uh, to Zach's point, I also don't have a shop locally that I would 100% trust with everything. There's a few that I would consider and all of them were booked. And so I actually selected a shop for my wife's Volkswagen and I was hesitant on the experience that I was going to have. And I walked away extremely impressed with their uh, communication and how they kept me informed throughout the way. So keeping it really simple, if that's not something that they're currently doing, Doing. I know for me, I was sitting here, you know, working, going through different things. I'm like, I wonder what's going on. And then minutes later, I get an email and a message with photos, with a message. And there must have been at least 13 photos of the repair, which was a suspension, uh, uh, shock springs, an axle, and detailed photos of everything. And I kind of sat back for a second. I was like, wow, every concern or every thought that I had, had just been answered. Uh, I no longer had that urge or need to potentially call and find out, hey, you know, how's that going? You know, what, what's the estimated turnaround time and whatnot? And that was, you know, being the, on the customer side of it was really Really, really pleasant. Uh, and so uh, just those, I, everyone's mentioned it in, in different ways. And I know this is very recent for me in the last two months that I've been through that. And I think those simple, I mean, it's, uh, if, it's one of those really simple approaches to take uh, to make that experience in your community way better for your customers. This, so this is why yeah. I think that uh, Lucas should be in sales. He's like <laughs> shop monkey plug, but just like under the radar. You know? well, I, was gonna, I was literally just going to ask, like, do you know of a good platform that would let you like take so like screening phone calls all day is the biggest productivity killer like as soon as i get on the phone it's like a mind eraser for me like i, I completely forgot where i left off what i was doing and i can only imagine like your typical service writer's day just like every five minutes the phone starts ringing like a new problem a new thing to distract you from what you were trying to get done so anytime you can send them pictures or like uh, i realize i'm selling chat monkey here um, anytime you can automate something though, in all reality, however you choose to do it, um, it really is probably going to help with the customer experience and your team's productivity. Matt. Yeah. I wonder too, like, uh, what, what, you know, it sounds so simple, but are shops out there talking to their customers and asking these questions? Like what does build trust? Like, why are you here? You know, is that a part of the process at all? Yes, no. I've gotten feedback surveys before. So, you know, I, I mean, they, they were from, you know, larger shops, I guess. I don't know if I should be name dropping, but um, yeah, I mean, I've gotten feedback surveys and I, I mean, that by itself is certainly better than nothing. It tells you that the shop is taking that in their consideration and, and potentially at least making changes. So um, I, I appreciate it. that sort of thing. That's a great point, Justin, because you know what? I don't think I ever like just picked a customer. I was like, hey, man, how what have I done that makes you trust? Or like, I, honestly, just on, on a person to person level, I don't think I've ever asked a question like that. And I think that'd be such a great moment for the customer too to be like, hey, while you're here in my waiting room, any recommendation? What What is it that you like about us in terms of that? that part of the relationship that makes you trust what we do or uh, something else I could inform you of that you're curious about. I, I don't think I've ever asked that question, which is um, a, a mistake on my part, uh, a missed opportunity. Yeah, we did a, we did a, I did a follow-up call program uh, in my shop. And so we'd pick, you know, I, especially it was, a, it was great when business was slow too, because you just like pick 20 
you know, customers from last month and just give them a ring. Um, and you'd learn some really interesting things. One of the things that, you know, I'm going to make up a statistic here that I heard, uh, and, uh, you know, for every one customer who comes to you with a complaint, there's 10 who have a complaint who aren't going to come share it with you. The number's made up, but it's roughly, you know, it's in that ballpark. There was a study somewhere way Take back. Take those I numbers saw that, the bank. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can, you can trust it. Cause I said it. No, uh, but the, that's how you but, build trust. I, yeah, exactly. No, I think the principle, the underlying principle of that is that most people aren't going to voice their concern if they have it. So you do have to proactively go and find it, right? If you're, um, you'll, you'll hear from someone who's really upset. Uh, but if you just kind of irritated them, they're probably not going to come back and tell you. But if you ask, usually they'll let you know. So just I'd pick 20 invoices and call and say, how was the service? How, how are things with the car? How's if they were going on vacation? How was the vacation? Right. I was, you know, and tying to building trust and relationship, you know, get to know your customers. Um, I would make a point to try and ask something about their life. I'm not getting nitty gritty personal, but like, hey, you guys doing vacations this summer? How are the kids? You know, yada, yada. To every customer I could, and then I'd actually leave notes in my customer file um, so that I could reference back to those things. And customers, you know, the perception Dang, you're sometimes such a good this. service writer, man. Gosh, dude. Well, <laughs> like I was talking about my coworker Charlie, he could do this from memory. He just had the Rolodex. He had one of the most amazing customer Rolodex. Charlie, if you listen to this, uh, for those of you, you who man. don't know, a Rolodex is an old thing <laughs> where they <laughs> put cards. <laughs> Yeah. So I think paper it's like, on a wheel, you know, you turn <laughs> yeah. mine right next to my fridge magnets. <laughs> hand right on the Sorry, paper. Guys. Did I just date all of us? I think I think I think most people listening to this probably have a, know what the Rolodex is. Okay. It's got a contact I'll list. The, I'll take the ribbing. I'll take the ribbing. It's in your phone. I use a, um, I, I use a digital Rolodex. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty iPhone. sweet. It's pretty yeah. sweet. But I think the point being like the, anything you can do to to, sh- to build relationship and build you know, context. And I think this goes to what you were talking about a few minutes ago, Mike, as well, in terms of communication, right? I think there's one of the things I saw uh, and worked hard in my shop to fight against was a lack of good communication. And Lucas, the opposite of your story, I I now take my car to a shop in town here because I don't have time to go do all my stuff myself anymore. Um, And they're a great shop, nice people. But I, you know, I usually drop the car off after they close and I get a call probably towards the end of the day when it's done. I don't really get any communication in between, you know, and um, even me having been a service advisor for a decade (laughs) and knowing what's happening and how busy they are, that's still unnerving to me. I'm like, I'd like to know that you got like just a quick text that, yeah, we got your keys or the car didn't get stolen overnight in the parking lot or, hey, we're working on it. Everything's going smooth. Like just that little bit of touch would make me more loyal, right? If Because here's the thing, if a shop pops up in town that's going to do that, I'm not, I don't feel like I've, I have relationship with a shop that's deep enough that I'm going to stay. You haven't built loyalty with me. Sure. You can take care of the problem, but we're not connected. And that's, you know. To, to that point, Gallagher, I, I'm going to have to jump here in a second, but I just wanted to um, get this one thought out. Um, Moretti, you mentioned earlier the map of what's going on behind the scenes. And as I think customers of shops start to get more educated on, Hey, I've been, I've had this experience before. I've seen this before. They might start asking questions of like, Hey, what do you do along the way to keep me informed or, or what should I expect? And so, uh, it may be, maybe not a map, but over the phone, making a standard practice to say, Hey, by the way, while your, your car is here, uh, this is how we communicate with you throughout, like setting level expectations with their customers and saying, Hey, you know, we'll order parts. Sure. We'll keep you updated with photos, with text messages, and, and we'll stay in touch, but actually verbally saying that over the phone. So the customer kind of has that uh, ease of knowing, okay, well, I don't have to carve out time in my calendar or or put a reminder on my uh, calendar to uh, reach back out and find out what's going on with my vehicle. So just level setting those expectations right off the bat, uh, maybe like a, like a verbal map of what's going on. I'm ready to your, to your uh, comment earlier. And I think that's one of those things where customers are not going to ask you what your communication platform is, but they are for sure going to be thinking about it. Like that's one of those, like for the every one person that talks about it, 10 customers have said, I don't get any info from this shop. I'll probably find one that texts me every once in a while. It's going to, it's a factor moving forward. Um, I'd like to ask you guys quickly. I know we've, we've kind of been going for a while, but uh, you know, on the topic of community, one of the things I did at my shop was like, I tried to invite people to 
hang out. Like I had customers that would come over when they were not doing work with us just because they were in the area, uh, you know, have a, bring in a cup of coffee, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I know that clearly that is my nature to, to, uh, interact with, with other people that way. So what do you think about, cause I know not everyone is like is social in that way, uh, nor should you have to be, to be good at running a shop or at working on vehicles or things like that. Um, but what, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Just cause it is a different outlook to the, it goes back to communication, right. And empathy, like a lot of shop experiences are not very social, uh, and the the it might not be a fun experience to hang out in the waiting room of, of several places. And there's a balance of like, hey, you got to work, you got to keep the the vehicles moving, you got to keep parts coming, all those things. But I just love to hear your guys' opinion on what uh, might be some ways to build community in that way, where a lot of my referrals came from those customers that would just hang out. And man, when they got the opportunity to talk about us to other people, it was like. Oh yeah, you got to go to this shop. You know, I'm there every Wednesday because I, you know, I take my lunch in their waiting room and hang out and see what they're working on. Right? Like it, 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 uh, it, it paid dividends uh, for me. But I know that that's my nature. Not everyone is is that way. I think that for a lot of people, myself included, like that that ability to just carry like a like an easygoing conversation with somebody can be tricky sometimes like just that cold conversation uh one of the things that like one of the most creative ways i've heard a shop like help their employees was to give them actually like uh hotel hospitality training so they would actually seek out like these uh training seminars that are intended for like the hotel industry and since you know they're you know, concierge or i don't know exactly what you'd call it but um you know a lot of their focus is just on uh you know working with the customer and and you know just treating them well and and making them feel comfortable um so i thought that was uh, from the what the shop owner was saying that was like incredibly effective just because like service advisor specific training is kind of few and far between it seems in this industry, um, you know, you could probably find some hospitality or hotel type, you know, training in your area. Yeah. I love that. I actually remember listening to a shop, um, who specifically the shop owner would try and hire service staff who came out of like the banking industry. So for a similar reason, right. And they were generally very high level of customer service. Um, also I think, you know, out of like the anything, hospitality, hotels, restaurants, right. Um, where you're doing a very high level of service, uh, to that customer. Um, and the shop owner's particular assertion was like, I can teach the car stuff. I can teach them how to talk about cars. I can teach them how to write estimates that I'm not worried about the attitude that makes someone successful in a heavily customer service based industry like hospitality or, you know, banking, something like that, um, is really hard to coach and really hard to find, especially in the traditional, you know, funnels for talent for shops. And so their approach was to get creative, go outside of the norm, not actually try and train that like you're talking about Mike, but like find someone who's already built that skill or is naturally geared towards that skill. And then layer on the technical side because they found that pretty easy to, to teach and implement for their team. Um, but I think that, you know, two, two approaches to the same end. And I think that's a great, I think that's a great one. Moretti, just to answer kind of your question more directly, like this stage in my life, man, I don't see myself just hanging out at a shop. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> just, just, just well, where I'm at in life. <laughs> yeah. That, like that would be cool. I would love that, but it's just, that's not in the cards for me. So, so there's, there's a le can I ask level you though, of, Zach, if you, yeah. if you didn't work from home, if you commuted and you had to like take your car in at a lunch break, would that be the same? Oh. Do you think it would be the same if you worked farther from home? Oh, no, uh, that's good. Um, yeah, maybe not. I mean, it, it, shoot, dude, if you were at the front desk anywhere I went, yeah, hell yeah, I'd hang out. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I mean, um, right. No, dude, yeah, that scenario, yeah, I would. I would. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just think it's an interesting, uh, you know, I wouldn't either, but yeah, I work from home. I'm not going to go anywhere if I don't have to. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I would hang out at a shop too. I, I definitely in my younger days would hang out at shops, you know, being interested in cars. Like I know Moretti, your story is sim similar, just trying to absorb as much knowledge as possible. Um, 
And then now I, I think, unfortunately, it's like the paranoid self of like, what's happening to my car? So I better like <laughs> hang out and see what's going on and scope everything out a little bit. Yeah, I am probably that really annoying customer. Uh, but, but, you know, if, if it was convenient to hang out for an hour and I had some, some good people that were around there and welcoming um, in that shop and I felt like I could you know, have some Wi-Fi and enjoy some coffee and just, and just relax. Um, I, w- I would totally do it. And I, I do yeah. think that is part of the community environment. You know, you don't have to be out there, you know, at all of your local farmers markets and cars and coffees and all these other things, but, um, just creating a welcoming environment in your shop. So when people are there, they, they don't feel like they should just get kicked out or like leave as quickly as possible because it's not a welcoming environment. And I think that, that is yeah, one that's yeah. just so, so easy to do. Um, but, but often overlooked, you know, I, I've been in a lot of shops living now here in San Francisco. They don't even have a front office. Right. You like walk in a door <laughs> and you're like in the shop and they're like, what do you want? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it, why are you uh, here? <laughs> it's like, OK, like, well, I you just, know, like I don't, don't change it's... places. You literally just like drive in and you just sit in your car for, you know, however long while they fix your car. So, yeah, definitely like some shops don't have that like built in experience, you know, where you walk in and meet somebody. You got to be realistic. I mean, right. For every 100 people that come through the door, maybe one of them would like to like hang out in the building and, and conversate or learn something. Right. But, but it's that one that man, that one will tell everyone they meet about you. Others. Day. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The only Boom. good thing about those, uh, yeah, those quick <laughs> things is that I get caught up on my daytime TV. It's like, I don't ever watch it. And I'm like, Oh, they're back to life again that's amazing oh (laughs) i went into a shop the other day that had a it had a board it had a screen showing the current appointments and how far along they were and just being someone who's interested in the business i was like i'm very interested to see how fast some of these you know are moving and thought it was really cool you're bringing back memories of like in the shop they used to have the cable television up in the corner of the lobby and like i'd walk in to like go hand in a ticket and like wheel of fortune be on and i'd like get caught up in plinko for like five minutes like i want to see like uh you know i don't know if that's enough draw to to bring someone into your shop but i do miss that daytime television i I think the counterpoint that i'm thinking through as we're sitting here is like kind of I'm so busy. Exactly. This is kind of maybe the counter to what you say. It was like, I'm so busy in my day to day. Right. And I think you feel the same way. It's like, you got kids and work and after school activities and everything going on. I'm like, you know, I might welcome having an hour to just sit down in a relaxing <laughs> shop environment and not have somebody tugging on my sleeve or asking something like, I, you know, if you made it a comfortable place, um, yeah, I think I would hang. Yeah. I don't think people were leaving work to come to to our shop, but th- definitely there were people that worked in the area that would, you know, they would yeah. come take a break and use our building because yeah. it was a nice place to hang. Friendly people, yeah. internet yeah. was there. Uh, it, it was, you know, that or a mall parking lot, right? All right, gents, let's let's start to shut this sucker down. Any sort of final final thoughts on this topic to uh, you want to share? It all comes back in my mind, community and and growing right through like when this is just summarizing what we've talked about whether it's from social media word of mouth it all comes back to trust and um you know i think we've we've kicked it around well a lot of trust in this context comes down to communication um whether that's the tooling you use who you hire uh and and really just as the owner and you know the the team in the shop how you, the culture you guys create around how to communicate and how to internally in the team and then externally with customers as well. That's going to be a huge driver of people wanting to come to you, spreading the word. Um, I, you know, I, I just fall back to like, you know, the people will do business with people they like. Uh, and so be, be likable and share that, that likableness uh, with the community around you and it's, it will pay off. Yeah, I, I mean, I really just reflecting on what Moretti said, you know, I was coming at this in my head from the shop's perspective of how they can improve things, you know, consistency and expectation setting. But really what I took away from this conversation is just how much a big personality can really benefit the shop and just having someone there to greet customers and just to get them excited about 
you know, whether it's just what they're going to do that day or get them excited about getting their car fixed, you know, it does a lot. And it does a lot that marketing dollars can't really uh, help you with. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's really my takeaway from this conversation is just really focusing on building that relationship and having somebody there that can just get the customer excited for, you know, coming into your shop. I think it makes a big impact. Yeah. And I, th I think um, the biggest thing for me would be your community doesn't have to be the way I talked about doing community. I think the biggest thing is find whatever it is that you like about your business or you like about your life outside your business and try to bring that into, you know, it's hard to be, tell someone to be creative, but be creative in that community doesn't mean you have to be like, here's all the cool stuff we built. It could be, here's what we care about in the neighborhood or here's check out my tree collection. I don't know, you know, whatever the, whatever it is that <laughs> gets you fired up. Finger painting on uh, Tuesdays, guys. I, yeah, it's like uh, you say that as a joke, but that might be it. Like, oh, I, you hang up some art, you talk to people. I don't know, but it, it doesn't have to be a YouTube social media content creator type community. It can just be, hey, we really love, you know, the the south end of our neighborhood and we're proud of it and we're proud of where we come from. And that's part of our culture here at the shop. And, uh, you know, have you seen our neighbor, Mike? They make great sandwiches. You know, whatever it is, it's uh, it, you, you can do it in ways that aren't what we think of or what is popularized, I think, online. Yeah, dude, that I love that so much. Have it not be forced, right? Because I think the first thing people are going to see in trust is that you're real. You're being who you are. You're not trying to sell them something fake. You're not trying to cheat anybody. That's where it comes from, you know, that that genuine reality. And if someone doesn't like the culture that you're building, okay, that's fine. <laughs> you know, uh, it, that being being real, even if it's a little funky, is is way more worth it than trying to force something that who you're not. Um, but yeah, I, man, I love that point, Murray. Thanks. Justin, close us out, man. What do you think? Yeah, this, this was a great conversation. I, I think community is so important for any business. And, and when I think about like, as a car owner, what I want from a shop is to feel like I'm important. And I think it's it's so easy in how like fast paced our environment is to just dismiss an opportunity to take some time and make someone feel like they're important. And and I and that it it makes a huge difference and it costs nothing. Um I I love the example, Gallagher, that you brought up of just calling on past invoices and just checking in with customers. And I know a lot of that is just automated these days, but the the fact that you would like take some time out of your day and leave someone a 60 second voicemail or um, have a five minute conversation with them about their car and how things are going. I, I it's free and it goes a really long way. And I know as a customer on, on the other end, I would feel like really appreciated. So I, I don't think that happens often enough. And I, and that's, that's what I'm taking away from this, that, um, you know, the little things can get you pretty far. So, you know, focus on the stuff that creates good communication, that makes people feel important um, and and go from there. Right. Hey, cool. uh, Justin, did you know that ShopMonkey has this great workflow feature where you can like see the last <laughs> bunch of orders that came through? You? <laughs> if you want to pull your last 20 orders, just go to ShopMonkey and then you can have that populated for you. Report with those customers' phone numbers like at your fingertips. I can't help it. I can't help it. So, <laughs> for real though, when I saw that like topic, like the first part, I was just like, I, I talk about ShopMonkey all day and how to solve for this exact problem. Like, it's just like I, I could talk about Shot Monkey for the next two hours if if we wanted to. Sure. And we're available to do that if you'd like to demo reach out. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Well, as as is always, this was super fun. Um for everyone out there, like this podcast is a Shop Monkey podcast. If you're interested in an amazing digital solution for car care for shops across America and Canada. Um, check us out at shopmonkey.com or click on our link in the description below. And, you know, we'd love to hear from you guys. Um, if you're a car owner out there, like how do you evaluate your auto repair shops? Uh, is trust and building relationships with those shops uh, important to you? Tell us your stories and, 
you know, as a shop owner out there, um, you know, how are you building community and trust with your customer base? Uh, has this changed over time? You know, going back to our previous conversation, are you focused more on digital media now versus word of mouth? We want to know more. Um, so please, you know, share your stories with us in the comments below. Uh, that's it for now. We appreciate you all for listening or watching the Tune Up podcast and have a great day. Send me pictures of ducks. Woohoo! <laughs> Get the ducks. <laughs>